So just um, a very brief introduction to the standard. Um, we'll talk about this more in class, but just to provide you with a little bit of overview. Um, a performance improvement program is implemented by using a, an appropriate uh, skill development program, which is tailored to the specific needs of an individual. Um, a performance improvement program involves evaluating performance and identifying strengths, weaknesses uh, in your skills, ability, knowledge and technical awareness. Uh, it involves trying to improve uh, high priority areas of um, weaknesses using game specific structured and sequential programming. Um, we monitor our progress. Um, we use regular game specific assessment. You'll record um, the results of something prior to doing your performance improvement program. You'll probably also measure it in the middle and then you'll go along and measure it at the end to see uh, whether the performance improvement program has been successful or not. Um, and then we'll evaluate the program. Uh, so we'll compare our initial results and our, our final results and, and have a thorough review of what worked well for us throughout the program, what were the challenges, what were the difficulties, what were the good things, um, and use that to determine whether our program was a success or not. Uh, looking at motor skill learning theories now, a motor skill is an act or task that has a goal to achieve and requires voluntary body or limb movement to be properly performed. Motor skill learning is how a learner acquires and develops movement related skills. Throughout this unit, we're going to be taking a look at three different motor learning theories. They are the schema theory, which is what we're looking at today. Uh, Cobb's learning cycle and also uh, Fitz and Posner's stages of learning. Okay, so on to the schema theory. This was proposed by, by a guy called Schmidt in 1975. Schmidt's basic observation was that in sports like tennis and badminton, we almost never repeat the same action exactly. If most shots are unique motions, then what exactly is it that we learn that makes us more skillful? Clearly it's not a fixed pattern of instructions to muscles. Something more sophisticated must be going on. He suggested that we store a pattern of generalized movements, such as a run or a jump or a throw, and from these generalized movements, we create or adapt motor programs. So throwing a dart or throwing a frisbee. If our generalized motor pattern is a throw, we can create a motor program for throwing a dart, throwing a frisbee, throwing a javelin, a dodgeball, and so on. All of these different types of throws are their own separate motor program, but initially we have a generalized motor program such as the throw. The theory came about because the brain can't possibly store so much information for every single movement we need to make on the, on the sports field. So Schmidt's suggestion was that our ability to perform a movement is represented by three things. Uh, the generalized motor program that we mentioned before, um, then a recall schema, and then a recognition schema. So we're going to take a closer look at these three aspects in the next few slides. Within the recall schema and the recognition schema that we're going to look at, there are four areas called memory items. Now these will be um, highlighted in bold, so keep an eye out for them, but they'll become clearer as we discuss each of the schemas. So starting off with the generalized motor program. So the GMP captures the basic form of our movements. It's called generalized because the program doesn't just produce one specific motion. It can generate a variety of similar motions, such as uh, a forehand drive uh, at a variety of heights or with varying amounts of power. In creating a GMP, it is very important to be able to vary motions in a simple and simplistic way. So if you want to have a swing that looks like a top player, all you need to do is develop a GMP that produces the same motions. Get some coaching, watch videos, work on your form, and you can look the part even if you've never actually hit the ball. The theory is that the exact motion produced by a GMP is driven by parameters. For example, required speed or height, which are amounts fed to the GMP by the second bit of the theory the recall schema, which we're going to take a look at now. The recall schema provides adjustments to the generalized motor program after understanding the situation you find yourself in, which is the knowledge of initial conditions, and your intentions, which is the knowledge of response specifications. 
For example, the knowledge of initial conditions relates to having previously experienced a similar situation. So before Ronaldo even finds himself in this situation with the ball, he will think to himself, have I seen this situation before? He'll be assessing uh, things like where is the goal, where are the opposition, where are his teammates, what is the environment like, is it wet, is it slippery, is it hard underfoot, also how does he feel, is he fatigued, is he fresh or is he injured. He'll also be considering what happened last time he was in this situation. This information is all used as recall schema, so the knowledge of initial conditions refers to have I seen this situation before that I'm in now. The knowledge of response specifications involve showing knowledge of what to do in this situation. So as the double team here attacks LeBron, LeBron James and he realises he has seen the situation before, he must now decide should he shoot the ball, should he pass it or should he dribble it? What should he do in this situation? So the purpose of a recall schema is to A. Initiate the movement or a skill and B. Store information about the production of the generalised movement for next time. The recognition schema is what allows you to know when you've made an error. Okay, so on to the recognition schema now. The recognition schema is what allows you to know when you've made an error. These are the results of the actions. The response outcomes gained through our extrinsic feedback mainly knowledge of results. So sensory consequences are all about how the skill should feel. Jordan Spieth wants to drive the ball as long as possible as well as keep it in the fairway. He's driven the ball so many times that he'll immediately be able to use his kinesthetic awareness for feedback during a skill. He'll feel how, hard, how fast the club is moving or not moving, whether the club feels like it's on the right swing plane or not, and how clean the impact with the ball was. This occurs throughout the entire movement and the feeling is used in conjunction with the movement outcome, which is simply movement success or failure, to determine future actions in a similar situation. If Spieth drove his ball into the water, he would identify small sensory consequences that led to a failed outcome. There are a few guidelines you'll need to follow for successful learning based on the schema theory. The first one is create a plan. Understand the skill, sport and everything about it. What are the key movement patterns? Do you have the correct equipment? Are there any key cues to help with the skill learning? Is there any expert footage you can find? Implement a learning program based on the information you have sourced in your plan to learn the new skill. Calibrate your skill so that you can perform it through a wide variety of conditions successfully, not just uh, in a closed environment during a training session. Interpret your mistakes. Why did that happen? What did you do wrong? How can you do it differently next time for it to be successful? Test your skill development in an open environment such as a live game situation. If you can do those five skills, you will have success using this uh, theory of learning um, in physical education or our learning um, performance improvement program. So that's that's the first video done and dusted. Um, the whisk sheet has been shared with you on Google Docs, so please complete that before we move on to our next uh, theory lesson this week. Cheers.